you very much. So when we talk about the big changes uh, in our lifetime that are taking place, we often refer to technological change uh, that is happening around us. But in fact, there's another huge change that is taking place in our lives. And it is more important, perhaps, than the ubiquitous smartphone. And that is the change that is taking place in our demographic environment, and specifically, the lengthening of our lifespans. So statistically, we're all living longer. Uh, and we're living longer than our parents. We're living longer than our grandparents. And if the trends continue, our children will live to be 100. Um, and indeed, one day, 100 may seem quite young. If you go to Silicon Valley, all the talk in Silicon Valley is buzzing about the money that's being poured into research, into trying to break the age barrier so we go beyond 120 even. Now, Woody Allen uh, once said, I don't want to achieve immortality through my work. I want to achieve immortality by not dying. <laughs> and so he probably is quite happy. But obviously, uh, amid all the good news, there are some very important and serious and, and quite worrying trends that this longevity brings with it. One of them is what it will do to the world of work. If we retire at 62 but live to 100, who's going to pay for a 40 years of our retirement? And obviously, um, for the questions of health, there are very important implications. We might be living longer, but if we are not in good health, what does that do to the health systems, to the people around us, to the world we live in? So here to discuss these issues, I'm delighted to present our very distinguished panelists, and I would like to ask them to come to the platform. First of all, uh, first of all Mia uh, Kivipelto, who um, is um, a medical doctor, who is the professor of clinical geriatric epidemiology at the Karolinska Institute in Stockholm, and a, has been recognized by the AXA Research Board and won an award for that, won her Oscar for her, her AXA Oscar for her outstanding work. I would also like to ask uh, James Vopel, um, who you have seen uh, a few minutes ago on one of the slides. Um, he is the AXA Professor of Longevity Research, and um, he's actually the ex Executive Director and Founder of the Max Planck Institute for Demographic Research in Rostock, and works at the University of Southern Denmark. He has a very distinguished and long career in um, researching into the biology of aging and the statistics of senescence and the connection between public health and longevity. And finally, our third panelist is uh, from AXA, is Thilo Schumacher, who is uh, from uh, AXA Germany, the head of health, and a member of the Global AXA board. Uh, he's been at AXA uh, on the board since 2014 and been at AXA since 2008. So I'm just going to move over here. Um, and the way uh, the panel is going to take place is we're going to have um, some introductory remarks, some brief introductory remarks from each of the three panelists, and then we'll have a debate. So I'd like to ask uh, Jim, um, first of all, uh, if you would like to kick off by telling us a bit more about what are you finding about extending the barriers, extending the frontiers of survival. Thank you. So as I see it, longevity is the biggest demographic challenge and opportunity in Europe and the world. The, the major discovery about longevity is the frontier of survival is advancing. Many people, including many biologists, think that progress depends on an unprecedented laboratory breakthrough in understanding the process of aging, a secret that has to be discovered. Such a breakthrough would speed the advance of knowledge but the, and, and the advance of longevity, but the basic fact is that longevity is advancing with remarkable gains since 1950. Various medical, social, and economic improvements are steadily increasing the length of life. The rise in lifespans is not due to a slowing down of the aging process, to a stretching out of how long it takes for us to become decrepit. Instead, and quite remarkably, the improvements in longevity are due to a postponement of aging uh, to older ages, to a delay in debilitation. We grow old, but we grow old later. In France, to give some examples, in France, for example, the, the risk of death today at age 70 is the same as the risk of death was half a century ago at age 59. So 70 is the new 59. And 80 is the new 70, both for men and for women. 
Old age has been delayed by a decade, not only in France, but in other countries as well. And this, this was over the last 50 years, and we can anticipate further delays in, over the next 50 and 100 years. The advancing frontier of survival is part of the longer, larger life expectancy revolution. So let me give you an example. In, in 1840, Swedish women enjoyed the world's longest life expectancy, 46 years. Only 46 years, yet this was the best in the world. Over time, the record has gradually increased with different countries taking the lead. And for the last three decades, Japan has been the longevity leader. Last year in Japan, life expectancy for women was more than 87 years. So from 46 in 1840 to 87 today, best practice life expectancy has almost doubled, rising at a remarkably steady pace. Two and a half years per decade, three months per year, six hours per day <laughs> for 170 years, including today. So we, can, we don't have to deduct today from your life. But by, by extrapolating into the future, we can estimate that at least 50% of French babies born in the year 2000 will attain age 101. And those born in 2010 will reach age 104, 50-50. And half of those born this year may reach age 106 if these long-term trends over the last 170 years continue. That is, most children alive in France today will, if rates of progress continue, celebrate their 100th birthdays. Very long lives are not the distant privilege of remote future generations. Very long lives are the likely destiny of children alive today. The good news about this is that, or the best news about this is that the fundamentals of health are, at older ages are improving as longevity increases. In particular, dementia is being postponed, as is need uh, for help with the activities of daily living. Hence, it is better to define old age in terms of life left rather than in terms of life lived. In France, 50 years ago, in 1965, when people were 64, they could expect another 15 years of life. Today, it is 73-year-old people who can expect 15 more years of life. 73 is the new 64. And 50 years from now, if progress continues, it'll be 84-year-olds who have 15 years left. 84 will be the new 73. This, of course, has implications for retirement. If people retire at older ages, then work can be spread out more evenly in the population. People can work fewer hours per week if they work more years of their lives. If the normal age of retirement can be increased by a decade, then the work week in France could be cut from 35 hours per week to 28 hours per week. OK? Just get older people to work. This would enormously benefit young families who have or would like to have children. If older people work more, then younger people can work less and more babies would be born and well taken care of. Thank you very much. I think, I think Jim is running for French presidency. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, I'd like to ask, uh, to turn to Mia now. Mia has, has just published, literally two weeks ago, a fascinating study in The Lancet of a long-term study of old people in Finland called Finger, and, and uh, I hope you'll tell us more about that. Yes, thank you, and I first want to thank for the, for the possibility to be here today, it's a great honor. So really, my background is medical research, and I would like to highlight the importance of prevention in maintaining and facilitating our brain health. And I think it's really important issue in the aging society where dementia and Alzheimer's disease, the main cause of dementia, uh, have now become major social economic uh, challenges. And unfortunately, failing brain is still the fate for too many older but even younger persons. And actually every four seconds, someone is diagnosed with dementia in the first. So the question is, can we do something to prevent memory problems and dementia? When I started my research 15 years ago, there was not so much we could do. The picture was quite fatalistic, I would say. It was high age and genes that were thought to be behind dementia. 
Luckily, now I would say, during the last years, we have started to understand that Alzheimer's disease is indeed a multifactorial disorder. And besides age and genes, exposure to various environmental risk and protective factors throughout the whole life course affects if we get the disease and when we get the disease. And I would say that this has created much more optimistic picture for the disease, giving us possibilities for the interventions. And indeed, now we have the very new interesting data from our finger study that was supported by the AXA Research Fund. We are very happy for that. And finger is the first large, long-term, multi-domain lifestyle-based intervention showing that healthy lifestyle can indeed maintain cognitive functions and reduce the risk of cognitive impairment among elderly at-risk persons. And I say that it's multi-domain lifestyle, and I mean that the persons in the intervention group got healthy diet, physical activity, memory training, and management of all vascular risk factors. And then we had the control group who got normal or regular health care. And it was quite fascinating to see that already after two years, we could see clear differences, so that the intensive intervention group had much better, much better cognitive functioning. Uh, areas like the executive functioning, the planning abilities, processing speed, complex memory domains were much better. And these are exactly the domains that are needed in our complex everyday life. The questions here are, of course, how can we implement the results? What are the next steps? And I hope that finger could be used as a pragmatic, uh, practical model that could be tested and implemented in various settings. And a few key points are here, what I would like to stress is increase the awareness, what can we do for the brain health. One important issue is starting early. We should start the interventions already at midlife. I normally say it's never too early to start to prevent Alzheimer's. And that's because the brain lesions may start 20 years before, when we are at midlife. On the other hand, I don't think it's ever too late. We can always do something, and just postponing the onset of dementia would have a huge impact on the public health. And the second important point is the multi-domain concept that we could, we could show in the finger study. Maybe it's not enough to target only on one risk factor at the time, but we need to target several risk factors simultaneously to get an optimal uh, preventive effect. And here we all can do something, but maybe also society can support persons to do these choices, make the healthy choices the easy ones. So to conclude, I would say I believe that prevention is the key element in managing the dementia epidemic. And here we need joint actions and broad collaboration between different stakeholders to really make the preventive work feasible and possible and to promote healthy brain aging that is important for the public health but also for the sustainable social and economic development. Thank you. One of, the, um, one of the reports I saw in, in the British newspaper about your study said that we need to be dancing and doing Sudoku. Is that, uh, is that the recipe for a... Exactly. And as I say, the prevention does not need to be so boring. Dancing, you are combining physical activity. It's a bit mental. You need to know, think how to dance, and it's social. So combination is always the best. Okay. <laughs> right. Um, we're going to now turn to, to Thilo Schumacher, um, to get a bit more of your perspective about the business and the insurance aspects of this whole phenomenon. I mean, is, is dancing and Sudoku enough? Um, yeah, maybe we should talk about an insurance which covers also dancing courses, but um, I think, you know, every country is facing longevity um, effects, but uh, the Western societies, we have a double aging effect. We have less newborns. Maybe some part of the problem will be solved by Jim's uh, innovative French modeling with the, you know, less working for the younger and have then more kids, but um, uh, the, the, the issue is uh, really um, driving us. What we see is in the current portfolio that about 
let's say 20% of our portfolio consists of people um, above 65 years and they uh, cause 50% of the claims costs. Um, the question is how will this uh, proceed in the future? We do see a lot of uh, medical progress. Um, you mentioned uh, some part of it um, and we observe that the number of uh, chronic diseases and aging diseases increases as well. Um, the, the question is how can we provide and, and health insurance and it's independent whether that's from a um, statutory paid insurance world or from private paid insurance world, how can we provide health insurance with less people who bringing cash inflow and more people needing needed help. Um, what we also see is um, that about 90% of uh, the um, elderly people wants to, be, wants to stay at home as long as they can. They, want, they don't want to go to nursery homes. Um, how can we provide then services? It's a nursery service, you know, a kind of outpatient program, it's doctor services, some other services. Um, how can we organize that? Um, and last but not least, the prevention part. Um, this is uh, the thing that drives me most. Um, when you look at uh, health insurance, and that's more or less equally around the world, less than 5% of the spending is given to prevention. I can even go one step further, in most cases less than 1%. And we have seen a lot of academic research which has proven that it's worse to spend more on prevention um, to avoid physical um, disabilities later on. I think it's nothing what an insurance company or insurance companies can solve on, a, on their own. It's uh, what we need is a kind of a pen industrial approach combined with uh, the latest found, found, uh, findings from the academics to achieve two, three things. One thing, first thing is keep people healthy and maybe then dancing will help. Second thing is uh, help support people to stay as long as possible in their homes because we have a win-win situation. They want to have that. And second thing, it costs much less. The worst thing is that to bring people into hospital because we have a lose-lose situation. And uh, the third thing is um, to do more than, of course, if people are ill, then, you know, to give them the service they need. And then here it's also about outpatient. Um, and the, the, I think the digital world gives a lot of new opportunities. Um, Let's say five years ago, we need to be in a hospital to have a, um, a monitor to see all the vital functions. Now that's possible with a box about this size. It exists already. Um, how can we br uh, broaden an ecosystem around that? Um, what, what does it mean for insurance companies in my, in my perspective? Um, I think we're still not good in offering long-term care solutions which then will be uh, um, bought by people, by, by the customers. And the main reason you, you talked about um, the people might not accept that. I think they ignore it. They close their eyes and say, maybe what happened 30 years, I don't know. They live in the presence. But I think um, when we get older, and we know that, we need to edu do more on education, that people accept that they need to reduce their consumption today to be able to live uh, a life worthy um, you know, life in the future. Second thing, what I think is uh, we need to do more on chronic disease programs. Um, we as AXA have started doing that, and for example, AXA Germany we started that five years ago. We have about 50,000 um, customers, patients in the programs of 6% of a full cover portfolio, supporting them on aging diseases like uh, dementia, Alzheimer, uh, heart, lung diseases, but as well as uh, you know, AIDS and morbidity risks. And I think this is something where we have a win-win situation to reduce the cost. So, to um, provide um, attractive uh, premiums as well as to give the support to the customers. And last but not least, prevention. We need to find ways um, that we can spend more on preventions to prove to our customers that it's worth doing it instead of only repairing it. I, I think for me it's not logical, you know, we're not investing in providing or uh, keeping people healthy, but we invest a lot in, you know, in, in repair what has, what is then, you know, has been destroyed. And that's not the way of the future in, uh, in my opinion. Um, so uh, both, uh, both Mia and um, 
uh, and Jim, you've given us a relatively optimistic, sort of upbeat assessment of, of the state of, of the art. When I look at the statistics that are thrown around out there, um, they are anything but optimistic. I, I found, for example, the World Alzheimer Report says that currently there are 35.8 million people living with dementia worldwide. And they expect that number to rise to 65 million in 2030 and 115 million by 2050. In other words, tripling. So, um, so who's right? Are they wrong? Are you right? What, 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 how, do you, how do you explain that? Yeah, let me answer that. If uh, current age-specific incidence of dementia stays the same, then as populations age, there'll be a tripling of demented people by the year 2050. That's true. But the good news is that progress is being made in delaying dementia to higher ages. As we live longer, we lose our cognitive capacity at older and older ages. So the evidence is that dementia is being delayed on average by about three years per decade, uh, six years uh, since uh, over the past 20 years. So uh, it used to be the case that about 25% of people were demented by age 87 in, in, in a typical country. Today, it's age 93. So in terms of dementia, 93 is the new 87. And uh, this is very important. It's very important for me in particular, and, uh, and I think for many of you. that The uh, people are worried about death, but people are even more worried about dementia. And it's just very good news that dementia is being delayed. Um, I, uh, yes, I totally agree. And these are very positive news that kind of shows indirectly that prevention may be possible. However, I would just like to highlight two issues. And, and one is that these positive trends, I still believe we need to do something actively so that they continue, because we know that diabetes, obesity, physical inactivity are increasing. And if these risk factors are increasing, maybe this positive trend will change. So there I think we need to do something. And then also thinking globally, we know that in some other countries, like in China, dementia is still increasing because of the unhealthy lifestyle factors are there. So if you are thinking the whole world, the situation may be a little bit different. So what sort of incentives can we put in place to essentially improve the, the postponement and improve the whole prevention movement? Do you, I mean, from your experience with, with Finger, I mean, are, are, are you just telling them that they have to do this or, or can you encourage them to do it? This is a very important point because what we learned from the Finger trial was that we need to do something more than that. that than just informing persons, because in a way, the knowledge is there. People know what is the healthy lifestyle, but really do long-term changes, we need to do something. And it does not always need to be so much, but there are some things, as mentioned, make the healthy choices the easy ones. Have the facility, facilities for gym, have a person who can guide a person who have never been doing physical activity. We noticed that uh, doing the training in the group, the social interaction was very good for the elderly persons. Uh, cooking together, like learning how to do healthy diet, healthy cooking, there are practical things what we should do. So I think the model is there. We just now need to find the ways to implement it in the, in the different sectors. Let me follow up on this, which I, I agree with. But the, the new evidence suggests that the earlier you retire, the more likely you are to be demented at age 80. So if you want to delay dementia, you should delay retirement. Tilo, just, just uh, from, from your perspective, the, the sort of incentives that, that one could put in place um, you know, as, as an insurance company, for example, what sort of things are, are you looking at? Um, I think I'm a strong believer in gamification. Um, I think uh, a lot of people, I don't know the exact percentage, but I would say a significant proportion of people are gamers in some ways. Um, and what we have uh, seen is in the UK, we have launched with some big companies programs where we did in, um, install um, web application where you can form groups, you can run together from London to Rome for example. You can see you know, how fast it is. You can do compete to each other. And if you see other um, health apps, you see that you can uh, compare your performance with others. Um, and I, I strongly believe that that's the way we need to do, and that's something uh, we as an insurance company can support and install that in, 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 uh, as part of a corporate health um, solution we give to the, uh, to the customers, instead of not only paying then in the case that the person is ill and get medical help, but also to provide to, provide to getting ill. 
Uh, and just a short comment about the retirement. I totally agree. Keeping people at work. Maybe we don't need finger intervention if people are working because that's again the combination. Using the brain, the social, social context and even the physical, you need to come from home to the work. So that what may be the you know, solution. I'd like to ask you about um, what can research do to tell us more about the, the where where are the sort of the key areas that you think that, that you want to take your work, and I think also from Tilo in, in terms of you know how do you see research working together with business to to because it seems an, an, an obvious nexus between the two. Who wants to start? Uh, yes. Uh, what I would like to continue doing after the finger, as I mentioned, the implementation. I would really hope that we don't need to wait 10 years before the results are implemented. And we as researchers are not always able to do it alone, so we need interaction between different stakeholders. So that's really the key point. We should be more open there. And the specific issues, what I would like to read, uh, do studies in the future, is really to understand the long-term um, changes. Are people able to change their lifestyle for a longer time, not only for one or two years, but five or seven years? And that's something we will do in the finger study, have the extended follow-up. And I think now we have been focusing a lot on cognition, but we also want to do studies for depression, uh, maybe quality of life, and, and I would say disability also the health economic aspects. I believe that the same interventions may be useful for several health outcomes. I would like to see more integrated interventions, not only interventions focusing on one specific disease. You also, in, in Finger, you also focused on stress. Yes. Perhaps you could just say a couple of words about that. I mean, stress is very important. It's a, one of the newest risk factors we have started to study. And it's very obvious. We have new results at stress, especially stress at midlife, work-related stress, is related with an increased risk of dementia 20 years later. And I have many patients at my memory clinic who are burnout, who are stressed, and there again we maybe could find something to have interventions and early detection for these persons. So stimulation is good, but not too much. Um, I think um, the, the insights from the academics are very important. One thing, of course, we always calculate business cases, and we need the proof. And, uh, with the, these kind of research and these kind of results we have, it's really bulletproof proof that um, it, it's worth having that and working on that. So that's why we need that in order to invest money, not to invest it somewhere else. The second thing is, and uh, I completely agree with what Mia said, we need a long perspective. Because we as insurance come, we take risk, and especially in the healthcare environment, of 20 and 30 years. And that's why it's very important to see what happens then. If you have a perspective of one or two years, that, that's not really meaningful for us. And that's why to understand what we can um, you know, provide as a service for people to prevent a kind of dementia disease in 20, 30 years' time, it's a lot worse already today. And that's why we need that. And we had this longer discussion yesterday already about that, what we can do together, because that's really driving us to, to keep our people healthy, because that saves money, and that gives you know, the, um, the mutualization effect of insurance, the solidarization, um, a really foundation that it's, it's worth to invest in health insurance. Jim. Yeah, so to follow up on your question about collaboration between industry and academics, I'm very interested in the question of how long we will live and how long we will live healthy. And this is also a question that's of deep interest to AXA. So yesterday I had a whole series of discussions with people here at AXA about how we could collaborate on developing better forecasting methods. How, how can AXA work together with academics to figure out better ways of understanding? There's a lot of disagreement about how long we're going to live, how to figure out better ways of trying to forecast how we're going to live, how long we're going to live, and also how long we're going to live healthy. So I think it could be very fruitful uh, collaboration between industry and academia, academia on that topic. I want to pick up something that, uh, that Tilo mentioned when you talked about an, the need for an ecosystem uh, around old people, uh, because it sounds like, Mia, also your research is going in a similar way. I mean, one of the issues is the whole question of home care, as you, as you mentioned. I mean, are we set up to deal with 
this uh, currently, or, or what are, is there going to be have? Is there going to have to be a very big change and a big rethink in the way that governments run their, their health policy to essentially try and keep people at home? I think, um, as I said, most people want to stay at home when they get older. I, I strongly believe that they need, we need a change here. It's, uh, the change comes from different sides. Of course, it's if there's, there's a, um, a big, um, powerful statutory health system, the system needs to provide something there. But there will always be a significant part of the service has to be provided by private health insurance companies. And I, I do think that there's a lot of opportunities in the, the digital world, a digital solution what we have. Um, like this, you can have for very little amount of money surveillance cameras, we can see what happens there. You can, of course, the carpets will detect if you fall down and so on and so forth. But what's important here is that we find a solution um, that we, um, we make sure that the the, the data is protected. So data privacy will always be a very important topic and um, I think we must be very careful in using data. We can only use that if the customer agrees on that. There are a lot of advantages for customers and that's why I believe they will, they will give it to us slash our partners um, and we should not using the data without having the, 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 the explicit permission doing that. Because we are a trustworthy company as AXA, um, and the, the data is really something which is a very, very sensitive. Do you, do you agree? Is there, is there an, a big ethical issue around the use of the data? And how, do you, how does one deal with that? Uh, I think uh, the data, what is there, should be used. It's nearly unethical if we have data and we are not using it. So it's more to have the regulations, how, how it's used. But I don't see any problems. There is a lot of efforts. OECD had just a meeting about the big data for Alzheimer's disease. Uh, there is so much data there and it should be used. So that's my, my opinion. If I come back to this issue of being home, that, uh, that is very clear that if we are thinking dementia care, the most expensive part is the part when the patient is at the institution. So if we can somehow delay that, that would be a big effect for the patient, but also for the whole society. And using new technology, I think, is something where we could do more, giving in mind at the same time that elderly persons often had many difficulties. It's the cognition, it's the vision, it's the hearing. So we need to have the knowledge about the geriatric medicine when we are, when we are planning the new, new, new technology. I just want to pick up what you were saying earlier on, Jim, about work, because clearly um, this could really bring about some very important changes. And maybe you can talk us, talk us through a bit more about how you see the world of work evolving as, as we try and deal with this, uh, this longevity. Yeah, the, the, the total amount of work that's done in the country is equal to the number of people who are working multiplied by the number of hours they work per week. That, that gives the total work per week. So if you can increase the number of people who are working, you can decrease the hours per week that people have to work. It's a simple multiplication. And the, the, uh, my experience in talking with lots of people is that younger people, a lot of younger people, would like to work less so that they would have more time for their families, for their children, for their education, and so on. And furthermore, that older people would benefit from working longer. Uh, the, uh, it's healthy to work as long as you're able to work, if you're healthy enough to work, it's healthy to work. You'll live longer if you work longer, you'll get dement demented later if you work longer, and you'll be a, a contributing to society. You'll feel better about yourself if you work longer. So I think there has to be a fundamental shift in the attitude of people in their 60s and early 70s, a shift so that these people start uh, participating in society, start contributing to society, and start helping younger people. Now, I know this is controversial, but, but the older people that I've talked with about it, when they start thinking about it this way, when they start thinking about how much they could help uh, younger people and help society more generally if they continue to work, and also that it was good for their own health, it was good for their own cognitive abilities if they worked, then I think that a case could be made. People don't like to be told, work longer, we're not gonna give you anything, but work longer and you can work less, that's a trade-off that a lot of people might accept. 
Yeah, just a short addition. I totally agree. And maybe the key issue here again is the flexibility that when people yeah. are older, we should maybe try to find ways to work a little bit more in a flexible way. We mentioned already about the stress and we know that persons who have high demands and less possibilities to influence the work situation, these are the two things that really increases the risk of dementia. But if you have a work that is more flexible and you can more choose what you are doing. So then I am sure that this protective effect may be there. Okay. Well, we have, um, as I said in the introduction, we, we have this situation where, particularly in the Silicon Valley, people are investing money, they're trying to break through the barriers. Um, if this aging trend continues, or if it maybe even accelerates, um, where are the limits? I mean, could we live to 150? And if we do live to 150, what does that do to everything? <laughs> this is a really interesting topic. The, up until now, all the progress, all of the progress in increasing life expectancy has been due to a postponement of aging, a, a postponement of senescence to higher and higher ages. So as I said before, 80 is the new 70. That's how we've made progress. We have not made any progress whatsoever in slowing down the rate of aging, slowing down how many years it takes for a, a person uh, to get older and older. It's, it, it's been a postponement, but not a deceleration or slowing down. If we could cut the uh, rate of increase uh, of mortality with age, if we could cut it in half, then people would live twice as long. And uh, a lot of researchers are working on trying to slow down the rate of aging, and this may happen over the course of the lifetime of people alive today. It might happen over the next 10 or 20 years. So there, there could possibly be an even more radical increase in life expectancy, an even more radical increase in longevity than we're talking about if scientists succeed in slowing down the process of aging. Do, do you agree? Yes, I agree, and I just would like to add this thing from my perspective, that the brain health is often, or the brain is often the weakest link when we are getting older. So that, I would see is the challenge. If we live 120 years, but our brain capacity is not there, then it's really maybe you know, a big, big uh, challenge. So again, if we can do something to maintain the brain health, then I think it's a uh, very good thing. Okay. Thank um, one comment. I think um, sometimes, you know, I'm a strong believer in, in digitization, and I strongly believe that digital instrument will help us a lot. But um, I, I don't think that the main driver of uh, longevity will be from technical side. It's, and m my fear is a little bit that if we think about, we solve that by the analysis, by new techniques and so on, that we forget prevention. Because that's something that is already proven, that we can do a lot of prevention, that we can, if we live healthier today, then we will live longer. And um, my fear is that a lot of people think, okay, I can postpone the, uh, the, the healthy living for 20 years and then somebody else will help me. We should not do that. Okay. So um, if you had to identify what you, what you thought would be the top priority for policymakers as they're looking at this trend, what would that be? Would it be creating an ecosystem? Would it be changing the world of work? What, how... How would you essentially direct them? What would you suggest that they need to really focus on? As I suggested before, the main uh, initiative from the policy side would have to be to make age of retirement more flexible, to allow people to work longer if they want to work longer, and to make it uh, possible for them to, to uh, earn an, in an income by working longer and give them incentives to work longer as long as they're healthy enough to work longer. But also to follow up on what was just said about prevention, the uh, why is it that we're staying healthy longer? Uh, why is it that we're getting demented later and later in life? Why is the, 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 the uh, dementia being postponed by three years every decade? Well, the evidence is that there are two main factors. The, the one is that we're better educated, and better educated people can delay dementia. They use their brain more, and they get dementia later. They, not only are we better educated, but we're more intelligent. The IQs are going up by a standard deviation every generation. So we're geniuses compared to our grandparents. And it's, it's, uh, it's quite amazing, and it's just an astonishing trend. Um, and they, so more intelligent, more educated people live longer and live longer healthy. Secondly, we're reaching old age in better shape, and that's also helping postpone dementia. So if your heart is in good shape, if your body's in good shape, your brain is also more likely to be in good shape. So I agree completely that keeping yourself in good shape, keeping your brain active, keeping your body active, watching your health, 
lots of preventative activities in terms of exercise and good diet and so on. This is crucial in terms of health at older ages. Yeah. Yeah, I totally agree, and I hope in a way that putting brain health to the prevention programs increases the motivation as well. Because as you said, people are very afraid of dementia. We know that a healthy lifestyle can prevent heart diseases. It's something that is there, but brain health, dementia, if we can do something for that, I have noticed at least that that may increase the motivation as well. And it's surely important to put dementia prevention very as a high public health priority. And now there are both WHO and G8 Dementia Summit has been stating that very clearly that dementia prevention should be the high, very high priority. So there are many big state stakeholders doing now this work. But I think all of us can do something at the moment. So 